the Wade Center's podcast. The podcast of Wheaton College. Welcome to the Wade Center podcast. This is Dr. Crystal Downing, and I am joined by my co-director at the Wade Center, Dr. David Downing, and our producer, Aaron Hill. And for today's conversation, we want to discuss three of C.S. Lewis's famous sermons. Not many people realize that he actually delivered sermons in church uh, because the sermons we're going to discuss today became famous once they were published, and Mm. people just consider them as essays today. But we are going to start with his very first sermon, which was delivered not long after Britain entered World War II. So we're talking October of 1939. Mm. C.S. Lewis delivered a sermon in St. Mary the Virgin Church in Oxford, and that is the the big university church at Oxford. And he calls it Learning in Wartime, which makes perfect sense. And it is totally relevant to us today as we look at what's happening in the Ukraine. Mm. And we can talk about that later, but I've heard people say, I wonder if we're on the verge of World War III. Mm. So Lewis has much to say to us about learning in wartime. And David, why don't you start us off with explaining what he means about learning in wartime? Are we supposed to learn how to better battle our enemy? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, well, his idea is why are we pursuing learning if uh, a university is a society for the pursuit of learning and history and literature and the sciences? Why are we pursuing what seems to be a leisure activity when we have this world war? Mm. Uh, England is going to be bombed. All the younger men are being called up for service. Uh, even the older men like Lewis and T.S. Eliot and Tolkien will be fire marshals and uh, blackout guards and that sort of thing, part mm. of the home army. So he's saying... Uh, why are we still here at a university learning these liberal arts subjects when the whole country is being engulfed by this war? Yeah. And it's a good question. So he says, so we're a society for the pursuit of learning, but we're getting caught up in this huge war. Isn't this like Nero fiddling while Rome mm, burns? Yeah, I like that. Something very important is happening. And what are we doing, you know, fiddling around with learning? Yeah. And he starts out saying as a Christian, Nero's situation was even worse than he realized because he's not just fiddling while Rome burned. He's fiddling on the brink of hell. Mm. So he says, as Christians, if we can still pursue learning when we realize that every human soul is headed either for eternal salvation or eternal estrangement from God. How can we be pursuing literature and history and music? And so he really sets it up in a great way saying, as a Christian, we have even higher stakes than winning a war with Germany. Mm, Yeah. Right. And I love how he does that by saying, yes, war brings death, but all humans will die. So to compare Rome Mm. burning, the fires of Rome, to the conventional view of hell as burning fire, it no matter the external cultural circumstances, learning education is still very, very important. And so we need to talk about why education is important. This posture was very... uh habitual with Lewis, even before he was a Christian. In World War I, he was outside of London at Great Bookham, and his father wanted him to drop out of school and to come back to Ireland where he thought he would be safer. Mm -hmm. And Lewis wrote back as about a 15-year-old, and he said, well, I haven't read anything in the papers about the imminent invasion of Great Bookham. (laughs) 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 He says, I think the best thing I can do is just to continue my studies, Mm -hmm. even amidst this unusual situation. So this attitude actually preceded his faith. Yeah. Huh. Uh, in the 50s, when people started talking about the atom bomb, why should we even go to work? Why should we? And yeah. he made the same point that we're all, it doesn't increase your chance of death. It's 100% yeah. for all of us. So uh, this was a habitual attitude with him. Yeah. Uh, let's go about our daily work and not assume that some alarm or emergency should cause us to drop everything. Yeah. It reminds me a little bit of Paul's advice to the, is it the Thess- Thessalonians? They're so sure that the Jesus will be coming back yeah. soon. They stop going yeah. to work and they, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a little bit like that saying, no, no, just 
go ahead and keep doing what yeah. you're supposed to be doing and don't assume that some cosmic emergency yeah. has canceled all the usual well, rules. What I like is that he taps into uh, the sort of larger discussion that's always this sort of undercurrent within Protestantism, especially within evangelicalism. And he has a quote in there. He says, we always have to answer the question, how can you be so frivolous and selfish to think of anything but the salvation of souls? Mm -hmm. Right. And there's this element. And I mean, I, I experienced this growing up. Um, and he actually goes on. He says, it is clear that Christianity does not exclude any of the ordinary activities. All our merely natural activities will be accepted if they're offered to God. Even the humblest of them, of them will be sinful if they are not. And so he, he makes this argument that like just because we become Christians doesn't mean we stop eating and drinking and having children and loving people and going right. to work and things like that. They just take on a new meaning. And if we put off doing these normal activities until everything is fixed, until everyone is fed, until there are no wars, then we'll never do it. Right. And right. he makes the argument in there that, you know, at some point people decided that they just wanted beauty. They just wanted knowledge and they weren't going to wait until everything was fixed to do it. Um, and I, I just, I find that a really persuasive argument, especially in face of that kind of evangelical argument about like, well, how can you be so frivolous to think about anything except for the salvation right. of human souls? Well, he gives the analogy of a lifeguard who, yes, that you should save drowning people. And so we should be willing to die for our country or our cause or yeah. our faith, but that doesn't mean we should be willing to live every second. Yes. I have to be thinking about saving drowning people. I love that mm. section. He says the rescue of drowning men is then a duty worth dying for, but not worth living for. Right. It seems to me that all political duties, among which I include military duties, are of this kind. He who surrenders himself without reservation to the temporal claims of a nation or a party or a class is rendering to Caesar that which of all things most emphatically belongs to God himself. Right. right. And right. that is so relevant these days oh gosh, where yes. Christians seem to have displaced their honoring of God to supporting a political party yes. such that for me to live isn't Christ. For me to live is my party's political yeah. platform, and I use Christ as a prop to yeah. hold it up. And here, Lewis is talking about that very idea back in 1939. So that's why these sermons were focused on an issue, and they are still being reprinted. Well, I think he, I mean, he identifies that early on in the essay when he says war created no absolutely new situation. It simply aggravates the permanent situation so that we can no longer ignore it. Life has never been normal. Right. And so he's, he's sort of pointing out like, this is just how things are. War just forces us to look at it. It forces us to look right. at death and suffering in a way that we would typically, you know, tend to not want to do. We want to ignore that. And so it forces us to pay attention and to see things as they truly are. Uh, but it, it, it also exposes sort of the falseness of some of these arguments that are, you know, like, well, you have to dedicate your life to this thing and do nothing else besides that, or you're wasting your life or you're being frivolous or whatever. Mm. Why go to school when people are hung going hungry, you know? Mm. Mm. Well, his, his examples are great. Um, when he became a soldier, he assumed that being on the battlefront would be all war. He said, <laughs> he said actually, once you get there, the closer you get to the battlefront, yeah. The less people are talking about the war. Yeah. If you look at his letters from uh, the front in World War One, he says, "Please send me this novel. Can I get the letters of Samuel Pepys?" And he has a lot of time to yeah. cultivate the intellect and to talk about things. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and so he says, "War is an is a finite thing, and the human soul is infinite. So yeah. no finite thing can completely fill up the human soul." Mm. He has all these great examples, which his listeners would have recognized because they're well-educated the way he is. Yeah. Uh, once again, I refer to uh, Aaron Smilda's uh, website called louisiana.nl, uh -huh. and he will tell you the fellow who's propounding uh, mathematical uh, propositions in the middle of a siege is Archimedes. Oh, okay. He yeah, literally yeah. was drawing circles on the floor when the soldiers <laughs> broke in, and he, he said, don't mess up the circles. You know, keep the <laughs> you know, at the moment of death, he was still thinking about the, the mathematical work he was yeah, doing. Wow. Yeah, that reminds me of Sayer's view of the Imago Dei, uh -huh. that we are created in the image of God. And she says, well, that Genesis 127 that tells us we're created in God's image, God is presented as a creator. So God saw that all God created was good. God saw that it was good. Yeah. And so our creativity in and of itself is good as well. Like Archimedes, it's yeah. worth figuring out 
these mathematical issues that have come to us yeah. through the centuries. And another line that reinforces this in Lewis's sermon is, good philosophy must exist. In other mm. words, we need philosophers. Good philosophy must exist if for no other reason, because bad philosophy needs to be answered. Yes. So for someone to think, oh, I am in error if I'm doing anything but pure evangelism, yeah. those people are allowing bad philosophy to be perpetuated. Yeah. We need Christians who are countering problematic anti-Christian yeah. views, well, whether in the sciences or philosophy. Yeah, especially in a crisis, because oftentimes when a crisis occurs, that's when you realize that you've made some sort of fundamental mistake as a society or as a nation. And I mean, yes, it makes sense to, you know, fight to defend freedom or, you know, to liberate, um, you know, the people that were being uh, oppressed in, in, you know, Germany and, the, you know, concentration camps, all that kind of stuff. It makes sense to do that. But at some point, somebody has to sit back and reflect on the mistakes that we made and then try and make better decisions moving forward. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. Well, some of his examples, I just love his uh, specific examples. Once again, if you go to Aaron Smilda's site, when he talks about the uh, the officer who admiring the poem, Oh yeah. Uh, the yes. uh, British officer, James Wolfe, was getting ready to lay siege to the city of Quebec, right? During the... the uh, Right, uh, mm. which war, in 1765. War and he got a copy of The Elegy written in a country churchyard in this beautiful poem. Uh -huh. And he said, I would rather have written this poem than to take Quebec. Wow. So he was more on the night before, and, and eventually he would die in the battle. But he's thinking about the beauty of this poetry wow. the night before he goes into a, a major battle. Right. Wow. Again, beauty, the power of beauty, of creativity. Yeah. I think also um, you mentioned earlier, David, about um, his comment about Lewis's uh, example about being on the front lines, you know, and that the closer he got to the battle, the more sort of ordinary things and less people were thinking about war. It makes me think about how I used to try and portray to people uh, that what we're reading in the Gospels are the highlights of everything that they did, that mm. if it was recorded, it would be like, and then they walked 12 miles and they slept. Right. That's right. <laughs> and they <laughs> ate dinner, you know? And yeah. Jesus Some... went to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And and the fact that, you know, there are 30 years of Jesus's life, you know, where we have no account of what he was doing. It's like, and Jesus made a chair. And then on this right. day, Jesus made a table for his neighbor. And you know what I mean? It's There's so much mundane stuff that happened, even in the lives of Jesus, Peter, Paul, and John, all these people that we read about. And we're just reading the highlights of their lives. And so, you know, even the people that we hold up as examples, we tend to just focus on, you know, the campaigns that Billy Graham, you know, did where he led all these people to Christ. But we don't talk about all the times in between that where he was just being a dad or he was mm. just being a husband or this, that or the other. And uh, we sort of boil life down to those highlights. And then we compare our lives to it and we go, well, how mm. come my life isn't like that? You know? Mm -hmm. And Lewis, the same uh, syndrome comes around when feeling of, oh, right now we're in a crisis. And he says that if you look at any past ages, even if they seem rather calm and tranquil to us, to the people who lived then, oh they were gosh. full of alarms and exigencies mm -hmm. and plagues. Yeah. And, and so we have a tendency to assume that our own period is just so <laughs> tense and so full of uncertainty and instability. Yeah. And he kind of says, no, that's pretty much the human condition. You know, we, he says culture has always been lived on the, on the edge of a precipice. Yeah. It always feels like this. Mm. Right. Yeah. And related to this is Lewis saying that we are to live in the present. We're to study the past so we can learn from the past. Yeah. And of course that's part of learning in wartime, but we should not commit our virtue or our happiness to the future. Mm. And I think that also becomes an error that Christians fall into. They become so obsessed about the future and they start figuring out all these plans. Oh, this is when the end times are coming. And they aren't thinking about yeah. who they are right at this moment. As yeah. Lewis puts it, it is only our daily bread that we are encouraged to ask for. Amen. How are we treating our neighbor today. Yeah. I think that's especially relevant when he's writing this at the beginning of the war, because the two great tyrannies of the 20th century are thinking they're going to bring about a better world in the future. Mm. The oh, Germans right. are going to allow the master race to be masters of Europe and the world in the future, once they've eliminated all these other uh, subhuman species, Untermensch, and uh, the Stalinists think that they're going to install this classless society in the future. 
Right. So both of them are sacrificing literally millions of lives in the present for the sake of this hypothetical future, which never arrives. Well, I just want to sum up the relevance of learning in wartime to the Marion E. Wade Center that we, we represent, because I see this sermon by C.S. Lewis endorsing exactly what the Marion E. Wade Center is committed to. Mm. How can we learn from these past writings of Lewis and these six people who influenced him? Mm. And how can that make a difference to the way we live in the world? And let me give you a really exciting example. When Russia invaded the Ukraine, one of the people who had studied at the Wade reached out to us and said that she's in touch with some refugee families from the Ukraine, and they were forced to leave their homes, not even able to bring books along with them. So they Mm. are in these refugee camps with nothing to read, nothing to do. She says, does the Wade by any chance have any of the novels by Tolkien, Lewis, yeah. Sayers in Russian. Oh, or so Ukrainian. That, or Ukrainian, yeah. yeah. But a lot of Ukrainians right. um, read Russian. Um, that we we could send to them so that we could be nurturing them in the in the midst of their present crisis. Mm. So we the way does not have any in Russian, but we have another scholar who studied at the Wade, who is now living in Russia. And so we reached out to her Mm. and she immediately was able to send online texts of our our author's works in Russian. And that is ministering to those people. And in the process of doing this, she knew of a British family that is going to take in a refugee family. So there is now a family Mm. that has, has escaped the Ukraine that um, because of the Wade Center. Wow. So here are these people learning at the Wade and their learning is um, enabling them to connect and minister yeah. to others. Yeah. And so I think this essay should be called Learning and the Wade Center. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it Any is, last a, comments? Well, I wanted to just give the ending of uh, the sermon. Oh, okay. These three sermons are all so beautiful oh, yes. that uh, we wouldn't say our discussion of them is any sense of substitution for reading them directly. Oh, right. I was going to say, <laughs> right. I almost wanted to show up today and you're like, can we just take turns and I'll read one yeah, sermon? Yeah, I know. I, I felt like, the same way. <laughs> They're so beautifully done. Lewis is unusual. Often academics do well in their discipline. <laughs> But if you ask them to speak in chapel, it's quite clear that they are a teacher, not a preacher. Yeah. And Lewis was amazing that he could go from scholarly work to science fiction to children's fiction. And someone asked him to give a sermon and he gets these beautiful sermons. Yeah. They just, they bring tears to my eyes 80 years later. Yeah. Mm. Um, It feels like, it feels like somebody asked us to paint the Mona Lisa with crayons. (laughs) It does. It does. (laughs) Right. Uh, I just wanted to give the end of learning in wartime. He talks about the dangers of excitement, like, oh, we've got to drop everything because of the war, the danger of frustration. Oh, I'll never get finished with my project because of all these interruptions and the danger of fear. My life is threatened. So after he discusses all those at the end of the sermon, he says, all schemes of happiness that centered on this world were always doomed to a final frustration. In ordinary times, only a wise man can realize it. Now the stupidest of us knows it right at the beginning of World War II, we see unmistakably the sort of universe in which we have all been living and must come to terms with it. If we had, if we had foolish, unchristian hopes about human culture, they are now shattered. If we thought we were building up a heaven on earth, if we looked for something that would turn the present world from a place of pilgrimage into a permanent city satisfying the soul of men, we are disillusioned and not a moment too soon. But if we thought that for some souls... And at some times, the life of learning, humbly offered to God, was in its own small way one of the appointed approaches to the divine reality and the divine beauty, which we hope to enjoy somewhere hereafter, we can think so still. What a beautiful ending to this Mm. sermon. Mm. The next sermon we want to discuss was also delivered during the war. This one a couple years later, 1941, at the same church, the Church of St. Mary the Virgin 
of Oxford University, and it is called The Weight of Glory. Mm. And here he starts so provocatively where he says, if you ask 20 good men today what they thought the highest of the virtues, 19 of them would reply, unselfishness. And so your average person would say, yeah, unselfishness. That's the highest of the virtues. But then he goes on and says, but if you asked almost any of the great Christians of old, he would have replied, love. And that is so powerful. He is setting up a a paradigm shift that we tend to think of goodness in terms of what we do not do. Mm. And he is totally flipping that by saying, no, it's about what you do do for the other. Because love is Mm. always about what is good for the other. And interestingly, it reminds Um, reminds me of another Oxford University professor who has become famous. His name's Isaiah Berlin, who developed two concepts of liberty. So he's famous as a political philosopher. Mm -hmm. And he talked about positive liberty or positive freedom, as many people call it, versus negative liberty. And negative liberty is just um, leave me alone. I'm not going to do anything bad to you. I want liberation from responsibility and I will not do anything bad. But positive freedom is the freedom. It's also called adolescence. <laughs> <laughs> Just leave me alone. I'll do my own thing. Excuse me. Um, positive freedom is the freedom to be able to be, to serve yeah. others, yeah, yeah. at least as how Lewis would see that. But uh, what I was going to say, I what I love about his this opening, and I feel like this is the new theme of my life uh, here. <laughs> if I could evangelize people about this, he says actually in uh, on learning in wartime, he makes a statement about what what would be good about being a professor and learning and edu- you know ag- being engaged in the life of the mind, and he says that it would be good only so long as we keep the impulse pure and disinterested. So he actually kind of you know, follows and parrots this definition to correct it later in the weight of glory. And, but I just love how he's saying this idea of, uh, the highest virtue being unselfishness comes in by way of Kant and the Stoics. And Uh. this idea that what, what we do is we confuse, uh, you know, we're not supposed to have selfish motives. We're not supposed to do, you know, you're not supposed to help David and Crystal with something just so they can do a favor for you in return, you know, this economy of exchange that we've talked about. But what we do is we make the mistake of negating it and saying, well, then you have to do things that are purely disinterested where you want nothing. You have no outcome that you desire. And Lewis is saying, no, there's supposed to be a there's a desire in love. You want good for the other person. You want right. a good outcome. And so he then kind of goes through the essay and argues what these good desires are. And he has this line about, you know, it's not that our desires are bad. It's that they're too weak. Right. Um, they're not strong enough. You know, they're not the right kind of desires. Um so I, I just I just love um, uh, the argument that he makes in here about our desires. And then he goes through and he talks about uh, the different ways that its uh, glory is portrayed and things like that. But right. I think that's a really powerful message of we're supposed to be doing good things. The highest of virtue is wanting good for someone else. And so you do good for them. There is an element of desire that's involved in it. Well, it struck me as I read Weight of Glory again that, that this sermon gives such a powerful overview of what is um, known in Lewis as Zenzucht, the sweet desire that these experiences um, that we have in life where we just have a sense of glory are making us realize that there is something that transcends our physical experience, Mm -hmm. that we were made for heaven. And you're exactly right, Aaron, it's kind of like a giving the opposite uh, perspective on things where during learning in wartime, no, don't fixate on the future of heaven. Mm. But now he's saying, uh, he's not saying, yes, fixate on the future of heaven. He's just saying things that are uh, we experience as glorious now are just directing us to the greater glory to come. Mm. Yeah, and he does a great service to Christians in this sermon because we do have 
rather lame imagery to describe heaven, streets of right. gold and, yes. and bejeweled cities. And he says, well, actually, that, that imagery does come from um, the Bible. And he says, I find it kind of chilling. It doesn't excite my sense of desire. Yeah. But it's so clever how he takes what seems to be very weak imagery, and he shows you how it ties into this uh, sinsuk. One of our listeners wants us to say zainzuk. And uh, <laughs> my, uh, my rebuttal would be, or my reply would be, we don't say Paris, we say Paris. So we're going we're gonna to allow that word to be. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Americanized or Same foreign words with a foreign yeah. accent. Yeah. Right. But that, he calls it the inconsolable longing. That we, right. Mm. I love the phrase. He says, we fiddle around with drink and sex and ambition. We're like ignorant children who would rather play mud pies in the slum and we could have a vacation on the beach. Mm. And so it's not that our desires are too strong for spiritual things. Our desires are too weak. We don't realize what it would be like to actually find the object yeah. of this inconsolable mm. longing. Well, I like because he, he's sort of deconstructing this idea of unselfishness and how it doesn't work with Zenzuk because there's a desire that we have for something more, for something greater that we feel like can't be satisfied. But if we buy into this idea of the highest virtue of a Christian is sort of not desiring anything is unselfishness then you kind of become a buddhist you just become detached uh, right, from everything right. yeah good and his point. argument is uh he says he goes on to say if we are made for heaven the desire for our proper place will already be in us but not yet attached to the true object and will even appear as the rival of that object and so he says you know in speaking of this desire for our far-off country which we find ourselves find in ourselves even now I feel a certain shyness. I'm almost committing an indecency. There's this sense in which we shouldn't be talking about it because because we've positioned desire and wanting something in and of itself as a bad thing. And he's saying, no, desires exist because there's, you know, thirst exists because there's water to satisfy our thirst. And right. we're hungry because there's food, you know. And there's a reason why we desire for this thing that in a sense is eternal and inconsolable. And it's because we were made for that. And we shouldn't shy away from it. Uh, and I think that's a really positive view of spirituality that contrasts with at least what I was taught growing up, which was very much this sense of like sort of detachment from everything. Right. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, yeah. That's and also very stoic. He says early on that idea is stoic yeah. rather than Christian. Yeah. Uh, here, the whole idea of progressivism and evolution comes up again in so far, this is kind of like in Abolition of Man, where he says that all humans, whether they're Christian or not, recognize certain moral absolutes. Yeah. And he's saying even these people who have turned evolution or, uh, or progressivism like um, Marxist-Leninists into an alternate religion, they reflect a sense that they're is something better, something beyond. Mm. So he even uses that to say that there is this desire, but the trouble is people uh, misplace the fulfillment of that desire. Yeah. And love is the fulfillment of that desire insofar as we desire to be one with Christ, yeah. to be with Christ. Yeah. And then to love our neighbor as yeah. ourselves. Communion with God and communion with others. And, is and what that goes we'll back to the um, self-denial. If we're to love our neighbors as ourselves, and if you think, well, I don't do anything for myself, so I guess I won't do anything for my neighbor either. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, or, or it's like you have to bake cookies for your neighbor and then leave it on their doorstep so they don't know it's you. And it's like, no, the goal of baking cookies is... Express love. Friendship and, and a relationship, <laughs> yeah. and that should blossom out of it. Uh, and, and, but also saying there's nothing wrong with wanting communion with others and wanting communion with God. That's what we were created for. So it's not a bad thing to invite people over to a meal at your house because you want community because we were made for that. And, mm. but when we sort of vilify all desires as selfishness, you end up feeling like, well, if I'm not in a cave, uh, naked, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. meditating 24 seven. I'm, you know, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm being selfish in some way. Right. You right. Know? So well, those desires themselves are gifts from God yeah. directing our attention to the creator who loves us. Yeah. In many ways, this sermon could be a gloss on both his memoir, surprised by joy yes. yeah. and pilgrim's regress because he, reports these feelings, this longing for this beautiful paradise that's unattainable on the horizon. 
and you say, oh, is it in sex? Is it in yeah. romanticism and beautiful literature? Is right. it in nature? Right. Is it in uh, the occult and some sort of spiritual realities that we try to explore through seances and things? And so he actually calls it the dialectic of desire mm. in his essay on Pilgrim's Regress. You spend your whole life seeking false objects, and eventually you hope that through a certain amount of attention you discover the true object. I love the section on how it's not mercenary to say, if we say, oh, I'm going to be good just because I'll get to heaven eventually or I'll even I'll be with God. It sounds very mercenary. Uh It sounds like the economy of exchange. But he says the reason the soldier fights is because they want victory. And that's not an arbitrary reward for battle. That's the consummation right. of the battle. Yeah. He calls it the proper reward. Right, the proper right. reward. Which is as a natural extension of what you're doing. Yeah. Whereas economy of exchange is kind of arbitrary. Well, I got to do this if I got to get that. Yeah. Yeah. And the reward, he says, has no connection with the activity. Uh, right. If you marry a woman for money, that's, that's a mercenary reward. But yeah. if you marry for love because you want to be in a lifelong relationship. That's the consummation of that feeling. Yeah. Uh, it's very cleverly argued because it does show even what seem like trivial rewards, like well done, thou good and faithful servant. He says, if we had the humility of a, a dog or a horse that really oh. appreciates God's attitude toward you, that you're pleasing God. Uh, I love the way he takes negative stereotypes or negative constructs. And he shows you there's something even more beautiful yes. behind that than you yes. had imagined. This is a I, I, this is a master class in sort of rejecting the binary options that we typically right. get yes. presented right. with, and then saying no, it's a third way or it's this or whatever. Right. He, he sort of turns all those things on their heads. I wanted to mention he gives uh, the promises of scripture maybe very roughly reduced to five heads, and then he's kind of arguing right. it's not wrong for us to desire these things because this is what scripture promises, and this is part of our heritage. And so he says. Uh, firstly, that we shall be with Christ. Secondly, that we shall be like him. Thirdly, with an enormous wealth of imagery that we shall have glory, which he goes on to talk about. We should get into more. Fourthly, that we shall in some sense be fed or feasted or entertained. And finally, that we shall have some sort of official position in the universe, ruling cities, judging angels, being pillars of God's temple. Uh, and then he points out that the, you know, the first of them, we shall be with Christ is sort of the head. But then he goes on to talk about the glory one. So let's talk about that. What is he, um, oh, uh, maybe, maybe this will go uh, j- jumping off point. He says there's sort of two definitions that we think of. Right. <laughs> one of them is uh, means to me fame, uh, and the other one is luminosity. And I love this, this is my, like my favorite quote. He says, as for the first, since to be famous means to be better known than other people, the desire for fame appears to me as a competitive passion and therefore of hell rather than heaven. Rather, yeah, right. Yeah. But then he says, and as for the second, who wishes to become a kind of living electric light bulb? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I always yeah. felt that way when people would talk about that in the in the church. I'd be like, what? We're going to shine like right. the sun? Yeah, right. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Which is relevant to that metaphor that developed for celebrities in Hollywood. They're stars. Yeah. They have this luminosity, but yeah. they are many times, they're just empty headed light bulbs <laughs> and people are just attracted to their fame. And that's even relevant to the last sermon we just discussed, learning in wartime. Lewis makes very clear learning is a good in and of itself. Learning shouldn't be something you do in order to get a great reputation. Yeah. I'm this great scholar. I've, and I, I, I am annoyed sometimes by Christians who will even say, oh, yes, I've published seven books. <laughs> And I go, yeah, but they're bad books. Yeah. You know, so this type of um, acquiring luminosity, learning mm-hmm. or publication as yeah. um, for it, what it does for you yeah. rather than what it, how it expresses love of learning, love of God or love of your neighbor. Yeah. Yeah. And so you he, want your neighbor to learn too. Yeah. So he talks about what he thinks, what he sort of learns is the definition. And he says that he learned it from uh, Milton Johnson and Thomas Aquinas. David, can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, well, once again, I want to refer you to uh, Aaron Smilde's site called louisiana.nl. Mm-hmm. He literally will give you the passage in uh, Milton and the one from Samuel Johnson, I recall on that Samuel Johnson met the king. And the king says, oh, you write so well. And Johnson said nothing. And later Boswell said to Samuel Johnson, well, you know, why didn't you say something? And he said, 
If the king says it, it is so. Who am I to bandy civilities with the monarch of England? And uh, it was an interesting anecdote about if the king tells you you're a good writer, then you're a good writer. You don't need to say, oh, thanks, and you're a good king. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, no, no, no. Yeah. Many writers are better than I. Well, yeah. that's, that's what he, I mean, he, yeah, he talks about that. He says, essentially, uh, perfect humility dispenses with modesty. If God is satisfied with the work, the work may be satisfied with itself. There's a sense in which what we really want, our, one of our deepest desires is for God to say, well done, good and faithful servant right. to, to, mm. for it doesn't really so much matter. And he, I love this quote. He's talking about reading this article and talking about how the most important thing is how we think of God. And he says, no, no, that's horribly wrong. The most important thing is what God thinks of us. Right. And right. what we really want is for God to look at us and for us to see his face and, and for it to see that approval in him. Uh, and that's a deep desire that we have. And that's not, it's not wrong to, to have that desire. Hmm. Although an interesting counterpoint, I, I totally agree with Lewis and with you, uh, but in the last battle, the judgment scene, rather than they line up and Aslan says, oh, well, you I reject and you I accept, the the uh, reason they go one way or the other is their expression when they come in the face of Aslan. Mm. And there's a certain response, which is love and affection and wanting to be with him for eternity. They go one direction, and the other response is fear and estrangement and a feeling of that your personhood is going to be somehow surrendered to this infinite being and they go off in the other direction. Yeah. So it's an interesting counterpoint that sometimes Lewis sees judgment really as God's acknowledgement of your attitude toward him. I read that passage um, and I thought of the last battle as well, David, that's interesting Mm -hmm. where um, the face of God is will be turned upon us, either conferring glory inexpressible or inflicting shame that can never be cured or disguised. But how that, how I deal with that, because it's so easy for someone to say, oh no, you know, I haven't pleased God enough. Yeah, yeah. And I go back to an incident that I may have shared in earlier podcasts, but it was one of those uh, epiphanic moments for me where things fell into place because I was always burdened by the fact that um, we are told in the Old Testament that um, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And because God hardened Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh didn't let the children go. And then all these firstborn Egyptian babies are killed. And you go, well, God, you're the one who hardened Pharaoh's heart. But then I heard... um, a pastor, in fact, it's the pastor that married David and me, and he made this one statement, and he was talking about this incident. He says, the same sun melts butter and hardens clay. Mm. God does not change. It is our self that is either embracing the love that Mm. created us, and so that we melt and become one with God or we're hardened. Yeah. Our hearts become hardened. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So God wants to be in relationship to every single human yeah. that has been created. Yeah. But God, because um, he loves us, gave us free will, yeah. which means we can turn away, harden our hearts in relationship to God or melt in relationship to God. Or to go back to uh, the uh, letters to Malcolm, where he talks about the fact that the only thing that God can give is himself. And you have to think about that in terms of a gift. Like you you can reject a gift or you can misuse a gift or you can abuse it. We can can receive what he has to offer and then we'll have a relationship with him or we can reject it. Lewis has a real eye for the, these evocative passages in Scripture, even the title, The Weight of Glory, that yeah. wonderful passage in 2 Corinthians about all that we suffer now. Should we give you the, the original yes. passage for the yes, title? Oh, yeah, definitely. A powerful passage. He says, um, this is uh, in the King James Version, 2 Corinthians, the end of chapter 4. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. For we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So he calls to mind that passage. I love the passage on, I will give you the morning star in Revelation. Mm. He actually picks out the passages in scripture that evoke sin sucked. What does that mean? I will give you the morning star. 
And he has this wonderful idea that we see beauty, but we cannot become a part of beauty. And the final consummation is not that you look at it as through a window or a pane of glass, but you actually become one with beauty. Yeah. 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 And that's what I love about this title. It is, so we got it from scripture, but it's almost as though he read it and realized, yes, that glory is a weight on my shoulders, that I have all these desires, but not nature, um, sex, relationships, family, they, they don't answer it, but that proves that there is a glory to come. But the weight of glory is also a weight, W-A-I-T, for that glory, yeah. the ultimate fulfillment of being in the presence of our Lord and Creator. Yeah, but then he turns around at the end and points out that, um, you know, as, as Jerry Root uh, loves to quote, that, uh, you know, we've never met mere mult- mortals. You know, we're all right, immortal right. beings. And so there's right, a sense in which right. all of the ordinary things that we do in life, we're dealing with people on a spiritual plane. We're dealing with people that are going to outlast the sun. And so how we treat them now, you know, how we treat our spouse in our marriage or our neighbor has eternal, you know, stakes involved in it. And so we, we have to be cognizant of that as we deal with them. Right. So that there's a weight in the sense of a responsibility in for how we interact with other people. Yeah. Which is part of the love that he brings up in the opening of this right. essay. And so he closes it. So he starts by talking about the weight we feel the burden of our desires and that weight is as we are waiting for the moment of being in the full presence of God. But then he ends the essay saying the load or weight or burden of my neighbor's glory should be laid daily on my back, a load so heavy that only humility can carry it. And so once again, the love for God then transfers to love for the other yeah. and to help them direct their sights yeah. to glory. And he's cleverly in, uh, incorporating another Bible passage about bear your own burdens, but be willing to bear the burdens of others. Right. So he's literally yes. bringing in a passage about carrying the weight for other people. Right. The other thing, uh, sort of secondary thing that I think stands out to me from this is if he's right about the unselfishness versus desires thing at the beginning, which I think he is, uh, then it means that the things that we see our neighbors doing or other people doing is they're often motivated by a desire in them that is good, but has just been twisted in some way. Uh, right. And it can give us a sense of empathy for what they're going mm. through or the decisions they've made. So they may have made a bad decision, mm-hmm. but you as a human being with these God given desires can go, Oh, well, I understand why this person is seeking fame because they do want glory. They want someone to put their hand on their shoulder and say, well done. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. But they're just seeking approval from the wrong people, from the wrong person, you know? And so of course it's going to lead to an empty hollow life for them. And so they're, you know, but it, it creates within us this recognition of you two have the same desires, but mm. I can point you to the person who can satisfy them. Right. Right. You know what I mean? Yes. Right. You see that in real life all the time. It's amazing how easily we fool ourselves. I read a survey of parents of how long are your children happy with their new Christmas toys? And the average answer is one day. Wow. So there's all this anticipation. And then you open the box and you run it around. And uh, another example, my dad was uh, talking once to a very successful young businessman. He says, how does it feel to uh, not even be 30 yet? You've already made a million dollars. And at that time, a million dollars kind of set you up for life. Uh-huh. And the the young man said, well, once I became a millionaire, I started hanging around with people with 10 million and they've got jet airplanes and they've got cabins yeah. in, in Colorado. I can't afford those things. I need 10 million. And my father just thought, whoa, you know, we all think having a million would would set you up for life. But as soon as you get there, yeah. the desire just increases. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I think Lewis is quite right about how we want to play mud patties in the slums when we, <laughs> we could be going you know, to the shore. Mm. Let's talk about transposition. This is a, another sermon that C.S. Lewis preached in Oxford, this time at Mansfield College Chapel. 
in 1946. So this was after World War II. Mm. And he preached it on Whit Sunday, which is the same as Pentecost Sunday. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So interestingly enough, he begins the whole sermon talking about glossolalia. And a lot of people, in fact, Christians don't know what glossolalia means. Yeah. That's just the Greek term for speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. And indeed, this whole essay is about language yeah. and how we see language operating. So maybe we should just talk about his attitude about glossolalia itself. What do you think about it? David. Well, he gives two good examples. Once again, I love Lewis's willingness to tackle tough questions. Often with Christians, what do you think about speaking in tongues? Uh, I don't know. Let's talk uh. about uh, Christ feeding the 5,000. Uh, <laughs> people don't really want to look the problem in the face and yeah. really think about it. Lewis has this ability to really concentrate on a topic until he yields some new and illuminating yeah. insight. But you know what he does, though? What He has this uncanny ability to identify the quicksand of the topic right, and right. avoid it. Right. He goes, he goes, hey, look, I'm not going to sit here and debate with you about how the Holy Spirit works or right. these other mm. things like that's a he it's almost like he can r realize like, OK, this is an essay or this is a sermon. I only have this much time to address this topic. That's a whole book or that's that's for a theologian to discuss. And so he kind of figures out like where the what the most interesting thing is to talk about with the topic. And then he yields something good from that without getting bogged down in who the Holy Spirit is and how he works right. and all this kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah, what's the most edifying uh, path through this topic? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, it's, it's, and he always sets up a problem that we all think about and identify with. Sometimes you read a whole book by a Christian writer, and you go, well, I never worried about that. I never thought about that. That's, <laughs> that's not a problem. But he'll just say, hey, speaking in tongues is kind of hard to understand. Uh, and it gives another example of mystics using romantic or erotic imagery to talk about their relationship right. to God, like yeah. in the Song of Songs. And then he comes up with this brilliant idea of transposition, that often the greater thing has to be transposed into the lesser thing. Yeah, The spiritual has to be transposed into the natural. We were just talking about Sinsucht. And uh, Samuel Pepys has this sensation when he's listening to this music. He almost feels sick to his stomach. Yeah. Uh, and he says, how is it that something that would be so delightful and so transformative feels physically like you're getting sick? And so he says, well, this is transposition. If you take an entire symphony and transpose it for a piano, you're going to have certain notes that now it represents the uh, trumpets, now it represents yeah, violins. The flutes. Right. Right, right. Um, the same thing with painting. You take a three-dimensional reality and try to turn it into a two-dimensional painting, and white may have to be... A human face. It may have to be the sunlight or the moonlight on the lake. It has to be a dozen different things. Yeah. And so if we know about transposition from painting and from musical composition, uh, maybe the human spirit is a keyboard which only has so many notes and great spiritual things have to be transposed in order to be experienced by finite yeah. humans. Yeah. I, I, when I was reading this uh, this morning at a recent Winter Olympics, they just finished a uh, a downhill skiing, and they I just turned it on, and there was a picture of a woman grabbing apparently her mother and weeping uncontrollably, and then there was a woman looking up at the clock with a contented smile on her face. And as I stayed with the commentary for a minute, I realized the woman who was weeping had just won the race, and the woman with the smile on her face it was, came in second. She was resigned mm. to being the silver medalist. Oh. So mm. the human emotions they talk about, you know. Uh, crying for joy and this woman was literally so overwhelmed with her her jubilation that she couldn't do anything but cry hysterically and the other woman was obviously being very stoic and resigned yeah but it just showed how even at the human level without getting into spiritual things we have certain emotions we have to transpose onto the palate of yeah. crying laughing being angry. Yeah. We have a rather mm. limited number of keys that we can strike mm. on the, the human, uh, the human nerves or yeah. human emotions. I thought that was a really good analogy that mm. he gives there with your, your, the feelings, the, the actual sensations that you have in your body and then the meaning that we attribute to them from our sort of higher, you know, thought processes in our right. head so that fear and excitement and joy sometimes, you know, all feel the same, you know, you feel that 
feeling in your stomach. Yeah, the you know? flutter in your stomach yeah. or your mm-hmm. diaphragm. It reminds me of a time when my father was talking about uh, having shared oh. the Christian message with his father, who was a Swedish immigrant, uh-huh. and um, my dad came to Christ in his mid-twenties and became very burdened for his own parents, who always went to the church, but it was just more economy of exchange type uh-huh. church. you yeah, got to yeah. go to church if you want to go to heaven yeah, type yeah. thing. And so daddy was talking to David and I. We were just sitting around the living room, and the the moment he knew that his his father had accepted Jesus is when his father said to him, Jesus helped me give up snooze. And then and Steve and I are sitting there going, uh, what's snooze? <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's a kind of chewing tobacco oh, okay. and really unhealthy for you. Oh, wow. But after my father said, his father admitted that Jesus helped him give up snooze. My father just started his, um, we couldn't tell if he was weeping uncontrollably or laughing uncontrollably at this funny word, snooze. He put, he put his head down and his shoulders were shaking. Yes, yes. And we didn't know if he thought that was really funny or if he thought that was really poignant. And I bring that up because it's totally relevant to this, to this idea of um, how emotions become expressed physically. Yeah. And the physical isn't always a reliable sign. Yeah. When what Lewis is doing in this sermon is very philosophically profound. He's basically exploring what became known as semiotic theory, which is the science of signs. How do you interpret signs? Yeah. And he's making the point that all too often we absolutize a signifier, forgetting that the whole point of a signifier is to point us towards a signified meaning. Yeah. And I think that's why he starts with glossolalia, because there are some Christians, and this traumatized me when I went to a Christian college, I was told that unless I speak in tongues, I do not have the Holy Spirit. Mm. And so it absolutized this signifier. Unless you have this signifier, yeah, yeah. you can't be assured of the signified yeah, presence yeah. of the Holy Spirit. And um, we see Christians doing this a lot. Unless you use these signifiers, unless yeah. you say these exact words, you are not a Christian. Yeah. And once again, I remember at my Christian college where a group of people were standing around, a group of students were standing around, and someone walked by and say, hi, you guys. And after she left, someone said, you know, is, is Susie a Christian? And someone in the group says, well, she says she's a Christian, but she's not a real Christian. And we all nodded oh, wow. because we knew we were still kind of in this fundamentalist mindset, mindset that only if you use certain signifiers, uh, yeah. unless you talk about being born again and asking Jesus into your heart, you're not really a Christian. Yeah. And then that explains why Catholics aren't Christians yeah, because yeah, they yeah. don't use that language. Yeah. So um, Lewis is identifying an issue that is still problematic within the church yeah. and from different traditions where people in different denominations think, well, our signifiers are authentic Christianity, mm. whereas your signifiers are idolatrous or yeah. just empty ritual. Uh, he he has some key observations he mentions here. I wanted to just uh, mention those and then we can maybe talk about them a little bit more. He says about transposition, he says, the message is limited by the medium. This is me paraphrasing what he's saying there. The message is limited by the medium. So he gives the example of uh, when you're painting or you're drawing, the brightest thing on the painting can only be as bright as whatever the page is. Uh, so that's the first one. And the second one is what is happening in the lower medium can only be understood if we know the higher meaning. And I thought that was a really great point where right. and he gives this example of a boy that's raised in a dungeon and his mother draws for him what the outside world looks like, but he can't actually understand what the outside world is, even though he's seen all these pictures. Uh, and then the last sort of key observation he has is symbolism as a word 
is not adequate in all cases to cover the relation between the higher meeting and its transposition because it's not one by one like you were saying. Right. So, uh, so yeah. So let's talk about those. Well, you can see its relevance to the weight of glory, which we have already discussed. How people absolutize their desires and think that eating, sex, nature is what they're longing for when really Mm. those are just signifiers pointing to the signified glory of being with God. And I love the metaphor that Lewis puts into transposition how uh, many people are like dogs that if you point something out to a dog, (laughs) the dog just fixates on your finger. Yes. yes, my cats do the same thing. Yeah. And the whole point is is pointing that you want the dog to see something else. Yeah. And humans are like that. Yeah. They they just obsess with the pointer. Yeah. With the signifier, not the signified. Lewis has an example. It's interesting that he's giving these sermons at the same time he's giving uh, he's writing screw tape letters in the Guardian, which gets published mm-hmm. uh, the broadcast talks, which became mere Christianity. In mere Christianity, he's talking about people saying, "Oh, this particular instinct, like mother love, that's got to always be good, and this particular instinct, like wanting to shoot someone, that's always got to be bad." And he says, "Well, actually, you can't look at an instinct in isolation. Some mother love is so possessive and tyrannical that you would be unfair to other children to mm-hmm. try to give." Uh, a, a privilege or an advantage to your own child. Uh-huh. And sometimes if you're fighting Nazis, uh, you may have to shoot at someone, even though it <laughs> yeah. seems evil. Yeah. And his analogy, it's like notes on a piano. There's no particular note, which is always yes. right or always wrong. Yes. It depends yeah. on the context, context of the score. Yeah. But he's actually giving kind of a transposition metaphor there. It's not the individual note. It's how the note fits into the overall symphony. Yeah. Right. That is true. Sometimes you hear a piano adaptation of a symphony. And it seems okay, but you're getting mainly the melody. Yeah. And then you hear the actual symphony. Yeah. And it's just infinitely more rich than you could capture even on something as versatile as yeah. a piano. I bought a bluegrass album of U2 covers one time. <laughs> and it's, it's like the bluegrass solo is not the same thing as... Uh, Bono's, you know, uh, singing in the song. And there's a sense in which I can really only enjoy that bluegrass music because I know what the U2 song sounds like. Yeah. You know, you, you can only really understand the lower medium if you've experienced the higher medium or have some sense of it. And he, there's a sense in which only if you believe in these spiritual things and have experienced them through the Holy Spirit and in, and in Christ that uh, the Lord's Supper takes on, you can understand the higher meaning of it. Otherwise, you're just eating a wafer and drinking some wine and you know right, you could right. do that on a Saturday night with some friends and what's so special about that um, well and uh, context is very essential into semiotic theory one of the examples I think of of how one word can have multiple meetings is the word Lewis itself because where we lived in Pennsylvania David had a colleague named Lewis first name Lewis. And of course, David writes books on C.S. Lewis. And so sometimes we'd be having conversations. We'd be going out to dinner after after work. And David said, you know what Lewis said? And he goes, I go, Lewis said that? That doesn't sound like a Christian. <laughs> and, and we're going, yeah, well, you know. He's a, and it took us a while to figure out he was talking about this first name Lewis colleague, not C.S. Lewis, <laughs> but I hadn't had enough context yeah. to understand that uh, the particular meaning he was referring to. Yeah. And and this goes along with this idea that, that people obsess about facts without thinking about the meanings of the facts, yeah. what those facts might be pointing to. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was just going to say one of the things that I love about this essay, uh, and then also maybe some of the other ones that we've talked about uh, in other podcasts, is the way that Lewis portrays the spiritual realm and spiritual things, and there's a tangibleness to it, but in a higher dimension. Uh, he gives it, he, he always goes back to this example of Flatland with the 2D world, and, right. yes. and you right. know it's trying to represent a 3D thing, and the 2D beings just can't get you know this higher thing. But growing up in the church, spiritual things are often portrayed in the sense of like intangible, invisible, is almost like the the thought world, 
you know? Right. And so being spiritual was really just about having the right motives and having the right thoughts. And angels were just these sort of invisible mental creatures. And there was nothing tangible mm. about the spiritual life or spiritual things. And so when somebody has an icon in their worship service or candles or something, mm. you know, it, I, you immediately, you're just like, oh, that's, they're pagans. They're you know, <laughs> some sort of heathen worship or whatever, because we turn the spiritual into this intangible thing. And then it doesn't really become something that you can hope or you can long for because you can't hope or long for the absence of something or this just abstract thing. And so I, I love this essay and then a number of uh, Lewis's other essays like The Weight of Glory that we've talked about because it it takes the desires and the hopes and the things that you have in this earthly world and points them towards something, but not in a way of saying a negation, but in right. a positive fulfillment, something greater. Right. Right. One, one time we were, we were talking about Flatlanders. We were sitting at a picnic table and a, a walnut fell and bounced three or four times off the table. And we started saying, you know, if you lived in picnic table land where your whole world was the surface of the table, <laughs> you would say this green thing appeared and then it appeared here and then it appeared here. And it'd be this ultimate miracle. But when you're sitting there looking at the table, you see that it just bounced three times and then fell off onto yeah. the ground. Yeah. Uh, what I think is interesting, we're talking about these three sermons together. In all three of them, he starts with a problem and he shows you there's actually a deeper and more beautiful truth behind the problem than there is in the easy sayings. Yeah. So learning in wartime, why do we even bother with culture when there's a war on? In uh, the weight of glory, you know, why do we have all these kind of uh, pedestrian images of what heaven will be like and what we're supposed to desire? And in transposition, you know, why do people uh, use sexual imagery, erotic imagery to describe their relationship to God? And he has a wonderful gift for taking hard sayings and showing you a deeper insight be hard, yeah. behind mm, the hard thing. Yeah. Mm. Mark Twain said, you know, Christian conception of heaven is uh, so pedestrian because the greatest joy on earth is sex and there's no sex in heaven. And I wish he could read Transposition yeah. and say, you know, that's not a very deep criticism. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, towards the end, he says, heaven and our heavenly bodies are going to differ from, as a flower differs from a bulb or a cathedral from an architect's drawing. And then he goes on, he says, we know not what we shall be, but we may be sure we shall be more, not less than we were on earth. If flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom, that is not because they are too solid, too gross, too distinct, too illustrious with being. They are too flimsy, too transitory, too phantasmal. Uh, mm. yeah. mm. Right. Mm. right. That is a good place to end. The Wade Center Podcast is a production of the Marion E. Wade Center at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Our hosts are the co-directors of the Wade Center, Drs. Crystal and David C. Downing. Our episodes are produced and edited by Aaron M. Hill. If you enjoy the podcast and the content we offer, please leave us a review on iTunes, tell your friends, and consider making a donation to The Wade. The Wade Center is entirely self-funded. Financial gifts help support the expert services, fast collections, and varied programming we offer at no cost. If you have questions about the podcast or suggestions for future episodes, please email us at wade at wheaton.edu or contact us via Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. To learn more about The Wade Center, our seven British Christian authors, what we offer, and how to make a donation, visit our website at wheaton.edu slash wade.